In the movie Spotlight, the heroes are the press. They're not perfect heroes. Michael Keaton's character has the information about what's been going on for some number of years and instead of acting on it, buries it in the metro section of the paper for some number of years. I don't recall exactly how many, but they had the story for some number of years before they put Spotlight on it. But ultimately, Spotlight got on the story. And Spotlight and the press saved the day. Or that's how the story goes. I think that's, I think that's true, at least to a degree. It does make for an easier story if you have a single hero or a single set of heroes. And having the press being the hero is a fairly familiar tale and set of circumstances. What's crazy about my story is that 20 years later, after Spotlight, after the events of Spotlight, 10 years after the movie, <laughs> St. Louis is completely the opposite. The press isn't the heroes. The press is part of the villains. I've talked in other videos how the police are part of the problem, as they were in the movie Spotlight. In my case, it's the Missouri Attorney General's office, Eric Schmidt, Tom Albus. Uh, I've been terrorized by Tom Albus, a family member of his went after me. Uh, and then on the And then the, the investigative team investigating the Archdiocese of St. Louis, they basically wasted about 10 months. And then when they finally started uh, to get serious about the investigation and, investi and interviewed me for a second time and got serious and finally started to take me seriously, Schmidt shut down the investigation. I assume because he realized that what I was saying was serious. And then when I tried to attend the press conference announcing the release of the report, I was again terrorized, traumatized by the office of the Missouri Attorney General's office, thrown out of the building by the police, which was obviously incredibly traumatic and incredibly inappropriate given that I was, you know, my story was one of the stories told in the report. It was uh, released on that day, September 13th, 2019. And there's a, there are also uh, what seem to be irregularities within the police within St. Louis. Uh, the head of security for the Archdiocese of St. Louis is a former cop, and I believe that he's using his influence to alter records within databases I suspect illegally, to try to basically cover things up and uh, cover up, you know, the, the torment, the smear campaign that's been waged against me. But the most surprising thing is the, is the actions of the press in St. Louis. Now, at first, the press, Aisha Sultan, the Post-Dispatch were very helpful and sympathetic. In April, I think it was April 20th, 2018, Ice Sultan and the Post-Dispatch ran a piece that basically laid out my allegations that told my story. And that, that piece took, that piece was in progress for three months or so. They, they did a, they did their due diligence. Uh, and I know for a fact that they were concerned about lawsuits and because Aisha Sultan called me a few weeks before looking for precedents, concern, their legal department was concerned 
about whether there were precedents for discussing those kinds of topics. But they did end up running the piece, and then that brought forth a survivor who I talked to, uh, the survivor who DM'd me through Twitter and told me a parallel story about uh, what Father Valentine had done to him upstairs in the rectory, uh, things that Timothy Cardinal Dolan had seen upstairs in the rectory at Immaculata. So I have nothing but respect for Aisha Sultan. Uh, she, she wrote the piece. She did a good job. I am a little surprised and frustrated, although it's probably not her decision, that she didn't write a follow-up piece because in her piece telling my story, the Archdiocese told two fairly blatant lies about me that were part of the smear campaign. And it surprises me that the St. Louis Post-Dispatch isn't interested in correcting the record that the St. Louis Post-Dispatch doesn't mind being used by the Archdiocese of St. Louis as part of a smear campaign against survivors of abuse by priests. You would think that from a journalistic ethics standpoint, the Post-Dispatch would have a problem with that, but apparently they don't. They don't mind being lied to. Uh, and I'm not sure when that changed, but that changed somewhere around 2019 or so. Because in 2018, the Post-Dispatch ran another editorial. I think this was, uh, this was in the August time frame when everything blew up about that when the Pennsylvania Grand Jury report came out, the, the, the editorial board of the Post-Dispatch wrote a editorial naming me a supportive editorial, you know, thank you, Post-Dispatch, for doing that. I mentioned that in, in September of 2018, the Archdiocese of St. Louis held a massive reparation. <laughs> that was the mass at which I was, I stood vigil out in front of that mass and was ignored which just blows my mind, standing vigil out in front of that mass. But, you know, I thought it was a big deal. The photographer seemed to think it was a big deal. The Post-Dispatch has run that, that photograph a number of times, three or four times, to my knowledge. Uh, and I think that photograph perfectly captures the attitude and the, the attitude toward and the arrogance of the Archdiocese of St. Louis towards survivors. So that was September 2018. But then something changed, and I don't know exactly what changed, but all of a sudden... Well, and I still, I still talked to a reporter for the Post-Dispatch in November or so about the investigation of the Archdiocese of St. Louis. He still wanted to do a story. You know, I was, I was talking about stonewalling and uh, how that under, under now Senator Hawley, that investigation wasn't going on anywhere. <laughs> I was actually on the phone with the Post-Dispatch reporter and I think he was poking around and literally, I hung up with the Post-Dispatch reporter, and I think he was going to write a piece, and then I get a call from the office of uh, then Attorney General, now Senator Hawley, saying they, you know, just kind of touching base with me. Obviously, they knew that this reporter was digging around, probably working on a story, and they wanted to circle back on me because they knew that they hadn't been in communication with me. So that killed that story. That was probably November maybe December of 2018. 
But from that point, that killed all communication I had with this post-dispatch. And the post-dispatch suddenly went incommunicado with me. They stopped talking to me uh, and seemed to switch their point of view such that... So there was the... There was the sex abuse summit in the Vatican in February 2019. Out of that came kind of a new initiative and a new openness and Archbishop Carlson of the Archdiocese of St. Louis made an offer to meet with survivors. I immediately took him up on that offer. He said he'd meet with me and I ended up meeting with him on March 26, 2019. And I made a number of series, I made a series of requests of Archbishop Carlson during that meeting. Basically, I, I made him aware of and asked him to end the smear campaign that the Archdiocese of St. Louis was waging against me. I went into that meeting assuming that Archbishop Carlson had no knowledge of what was being done by the Archdiocese of St. Louis against me. I just gave him the benefit of the doubt. I did, I did record that meeting just in case. I recorded it without his knowledge, you know. But I assumed that it seemed like everybody was turning over a new leaf. The Pope, a couple months later, announced Vos Estes Lux Mundi, which went into effect June 1st. Uh, I gave Archbishop Carlson three months to act on my request to basically call off the dogs to end the smear campaign. And the most basic thing was, so I met with Archbishop Carlson on March 26th, and then after a couple of weeks, I started asking for a follow-up meeting because I wanted to know, okay, what's the deal? Have you called off the dogs? Will you end the smear campaign? What's the status of this? And they started stonewalling me. They wouldn't reply. Well, they, they replied to my initial emails basically saying it's too soon, we're busy. After, a, after replying to a couple of emails, they stopped replying to my emails and they just started stonewalling me. They wouldn't reply to any of my emails. Now, what's crazy is at the same time, and this is where things get weird, at the same time, that the Archdiocese of St. Louis is stonewalling me, I'm trying to alert the Post-Dispatch, my contacts at the Post-Dispatch of that fact and let them know, hey, the Archdiocese of St. Louis is making promises that they're not keeping. At the same time that I'm trying to let the Post-Dispatch know, hey, there's something weird with the Archdiocese. They're making promises that they're not keeping. The Archdiocese is, or the, the Post-Dispatch is writing a hagiography of Archbishop Carlson, who his birthday was July 1st. And basically, he, he was, he was going to turn 75, and whenever a bishop turns 75, he has to kind of ceremonially, but also kind of effectively submit his resignation to the Pope. And the Pope, it's up to the Pope to decide whether to accept that resignation or not. Sometimes he'll accept it immediately. Sometimes he won't accept it for some number of years. But so the Post-Dispatch started, wrote this, what I call a hagiography, a, you know, how awesome is it that we have Archbishop Carlson in our life? Uh, and I didn't realize the Post-Dispatch was writing that piece, but at the same time, I'm trying to get back to my contacts and saying, okay, the Archdiocese is, is still just playing games with me. You know, they, they said all this nice stuff. Uh, they said they're turning over a new leaf. So I asked them in good faith to end the smear campaign, uh, and I gave them three months to do that, so they won't do it, but they won't do it. They, you know, they won't call off the dogs. They, they won't tell the truth about me. And 
from that point on, the, the post-dispatch has gone completely quiet on me. I got one email, kind of perfunctory email from one writer, but they've effectively gone completely quiet on me and don't want to hear anything else from me. I don't know exactly what's going on, but I did get a sense, I'm going to skip the timeline a little bit, my sense of what's going on comes from Kevin Colleen of KMOX, who I met with a few weeks ago, uh, back in the fall, at a SNAP pr press conference related to the Missouri Attorney General uh, report that I talked about before, where Kevin Colleen came to me and essentially he let me know that the narrative that, he's, that he has heard and has been presented with by his higher-ups is what's new, implying that there's nothing new to the Catholic sex abuse story in St. Louis. Uh, as if people already know everything that's out there. And I'm gonna, I'll do a separate video on exactly what it is that's new, but believe me, there's, <laughs> there's a lot that's new, including the video I recorded a couple days ago in terms of the misdeeds of Cardinal Dolan and all the efforts of the Archdiocese of St. Louis to cover up Cardinal Dolan's misdeeds, including criminal acts by the Archdiocese of St. Louis, perjury, perhaps obstruction of justice. And then you've got all the collusion by the various news organizations within St. Louis. So at this September 13th press conference where the Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt announced the findings of his investigation of the Archdiocese of St. Louis, uh, for reasons I don't think are that mind-blowing, I wanted to attend that press conference. You know, I'm a survivor, I'm named in, the, or I'm not named in the report, but they devote a couple pages to my story. Uh, so I tried to attend and ended up walking into the press conference room at the same time with a KMOV video guy and was accompanied by a younger guy from the Missouri Attorney General's office. He and the Missouri Attorney General's office informed me it was a closed press conference, closed to the press, but, you know, I kind of blew that off. Uh, the KMOV guy kind of gave me a heads up that they might try to throw me out of the room. Uh, and if they tried to do that, that he would videotape the whole thing. Uh, so I kind of backed off into the corner a little bit, and that was my original plan anyway. I wasn't going to protest or demonstrate or anything. I just wanted to, I literally just wanted to be in the room. So like 10 people from the Missouri Attorney General's office were either in the room, came, entered, either came in the room or were standing out in the hallway and tried to throw me out of the room. And the KMOV guy got the whole thing on tape. And after about five minutes or so, they ended up calling the police, and three police officers walked in. I don't have a problem with the police, so when the police officers asked me to leave, I just left. But the KMOV guy got the whole thing on tape and then came out after the press conference, interviewed me, and set the expectation with me that this was probably a national-level story, at least a local-level story, if not a national-level story. Now, what's crazy is that KMOV... The local CBS affiliate never ended up airing that footage or even webbing that footage. They're sitting on that footage. I assume in an effort to protect the archdiocese, if not St. Louis. In some, they think somehow they're protecting the reputation of St. Louis. But this is where we get into how St. Louis is actually worse than Spotlight. St. Louis is actually more messed up than Spotlight-era Boston. 
in the in, at least as screwed up as Boston was in the spotlight era, at least the press were working to get the story out eventually. When the spotlight team got on it, they got the story out. But here in St. Louis, KMOV is sitting on footage, explosive footage, of the Missouri Attorney General's office harassing survivors who just want to attend a press conference and have the Missouri Attorney General just kind of tell them to the, tell stuff to their face. And KMOV just is just sitting on that footage, won't air it, won't web it. I've tried to get access to the footage so I can air it myself and they, they won't give me access to it without a subpoena. I've gone to the ACLU and, a, and the ACLU won't get back to me. I was also interviewed by KSDK, the NBC affiliate, afterwards for about 15 minutes or so, had some communications with the reporter for a couple days and then eventually she went quiet on me. So they've also spiked the story, never did anything about it. Same thing for the local NPR affiliate, KWMU. Uh, and then as I mentioned, KMOX, uh, Kevin Colleen. I ended up meeting with him a few weeks later. Uh, he seemed, he was, he was a little sketchy because the same CBS KMOV guy was there at this press conference a couple of weeks later and Colleen saw his sketchiness about me because the KMOV guy didn't want to interview me this is the same guy who, whose story had been spiked before. He didn't want to interview me at this later press conference, and Colleen saw that and got sketchy. Uh, but then I ended up talking to Colleen for about five minutes or so, and he was all, all on the story and wanted my contact information, but then got cold, I assume, because of some management-level decision. So you've got KMOV, KSDK, KMOX, KWMU, basically the entirety of the St. Louis press with very few exceptions, they've got this story. They know the post of St. Louis Post-Dispatch, everybody knows what the Archdiocese of St. Louis is doing to survivors. They know about the abuse of the abused. They know about the misdeeds of Cardinal Dolan at Immaculata, but what they're doing is they're sitting on the story, I guess trying to protect the reputation of St. Louis and protect the reputation of the archdiocese, but the truth is going to come out. All shall be revealed. You're not protecting, you're not helping, you're enabling. <laughs>